You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. And boy, do I have a show for you today. Now, with all my posts about taxes and my special report uh, about legally saving thousands of dollars on taxes, you're probably thinking I'm a little obsessed with this whole tax thing. And I am. And frankly, you should be too. I started really thinking about taxes about three years ago when I read this book from Tom Wheelwright called Tax-Free Wealth. Now, Tom Wheelwright, as many of you know, is Robert Kiyosaki's tax guru and one of the Rich Dad advisors handpicked by Kiyosaki himself. I'll also point out that it is one of the must-read books in my resources section, and I've only got a couple of books in there that I recommend, so that tells you what I think of that. So go to wealthformula.com and check out the resources section, and you will see Tax-Free Wealth. And you can click on that, go to Amazon, and buy that book. And you know what? It's not a boring book. It's actually really well-written and incredibly fascinating, and Tom's a really funny guy, too. So take my advice, get that book. By the way, I'm surprised that not as many of you as I would have expected have clicked and downloaded that special report about legally saving thousands of dollars on your taxes. I mean, come on, who doesn't want to save money on taxes, right? And it might be after this show that you finally figure out what I'm talking about and you go and you do that. And also make sure that you sign up for my newsletter. So let's get back to taxes. Folks, the biggest expense virtually all of you have out there is taxes. Furthermore, most of you think that you can't legally reduce your taxes, and it's just what it is. And I'll tell you, you are wrong. I know this from personal experience, having worked with high-level tax advisors, and it has literally saved me north of seven figures in taxes in the last three years alone. And I've even told a bunch of you about some of my strategies and created a special report that you're not downloading just to get a taste of what's out there and what the government wants you to do that will result in big tax savings. Okay, so don't take it from me. I get it. I'm just another doctor. But do me a favor. Take it from Kiyosaki's guy. This week's episode of Wealth Formula Podcast could literally change your life. That one was for you, by the way, Lane Kawaka. So grab onto your seats. When we come back, Rich Dad Advisor and the Michael Jordan of taxes himself, Mr. Tom Wheelwright. Are you ready for adventure and financial education? Imagine spending an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. Join the Real Estate Guys radio show for the 15th annual Investor Summit. Returning this year are sales legend Tom Hopkins, international developer Beth Clifford, attorney Mauricio Raul, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, G. Edward Griffin. And new for this year, come meet Buck Joffrey from the Wealth Formula podcast. Plus, joining us live and in person for his fifth Investor Summit, the comparable Peter Schiff. Peter is one of the few people who called the mortgage meltdown in writing before it happened. So come and find out how you can be prepared for the next economic shift. It all begins April 1st in Houston, Texas. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click on the tab that says Summit to learn more. Or call 888-GUYS-RADIO to talk with our Summit specialist. Spend a week with the Real Estate Guys, Buck Joffrey, and an all-star faculty in the 15th annual Investors Summit at Sea. Welcome back, everybody. It is a distinct pleasure today for me to have as a guest on this show, uh, Mr. Tom Wheelwright. Now, Tom is a leading tax and wealth expert. He's also a best-selling author of Tax-Free Wealth, which is, by the way, one of the few must-reads on my resource pages, if you haven't noticed that. He's a CPA. He's a CEO of Provision Wealth, which I have used in the past. Tom is also known for making taxes fun, easy, and understandable. Now, believe it or not, he really does do that. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. He specializes in helping entrepreneurs and investors build wealth through practical and strategic ways and permanently reduce taxes. So a lot about what we talk about on this show. As a rich dad advisor to Robert Kiyosaki, he frequently speaks at rich dad conferences worldwide. 
and to industry organization. He's a contributor to Entrepreneur Magazine. His work has been featured in Forbes, Accounting Today, Consumer Reports, ABC News Radio, ESPN Cover Your Assets, The Real Estate Guys Radio Show with my friends Robert and Russ, and numerous other places. So thanks for joining us today, Tom. Hey, thanks for having me, Buck. It's uh, great to be on your show. Awesome. So, Tom, before we begin, can you just tell us a little about where you kind of got your start? Because you're not your typical CPA, and that's why you're on the show today, because I want people to know about you. But tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, uh, I, I did start the typical way. I, I have a bachelor's uh, of accounting from the University of Utah and a master's of tax from the University of Texas. But And then I spent uh, my first seven years with a, one of the big four accounting firms, what's now Ernst Young. Uh, including three years in the National Tax Office. So one of the, the great opportunities I've had in my life was spending three years back in national tax in the National Tax Office of, uh, uh, it was then Ernst and Winnie, during the Reagan period when uh, we actually had the last big tax reform, 1986. So I was there in 1986. And then uh, I spent four years uh, as the in-house tax advisor for what was then a Fortune 500 company, Pinnacle West, and have uh, spent the last 20 plus years. Uh, I started my own firm. I started it from scratch. So, Buck, you talk, you, you talk about entrepreneurship. I love it. That's my favorite thing. The reason I started my firm actually was because I felt like entrepreneurs, the big four, when I was there, they used to serve entrepreneurs. Um, but they don't anymore, and they haven't for many, many years now. So I felt like entrepreneurs deserved really a high-end tax consulting um, opportunity, and so that's that's why I formed ProVision was to actually create that opportunity for entrepreneurs. There, there just isn't that, as you know, it's just not that doesn't exist out there where you've got that creativity um, that you get from you know people who have a lot of lot of experience and and a lot of and a different way of looking at the tax law but that's that's pretty much it I mean you know last 20 plus years I'm, I'm just an entrepreneur like everybody else um, uh, trying to serve as many people as I can and, and and do the best I can in the world with a great message along the way so Tom in addition to you know entrepreneurs and business owners and real estate investors because we have a lot of those listening to the show today my audience also has a lot of you know the typical high paid professional like doctors lawyers and software engineers and so when you when you come across those kinds of people, what do you think the greatest misconception about taxes for those kinds of people is? That there's no way out. And for a lot of them, if they're high paid employees, unless they make a change, there is no way out. In other words, they're going to be paying high, high taxes. And I, I, I know it's one of your podcasts. You, you talk about the retirement trap. And that is a trap for the high paid employee because uh, what you end up with is your only, your only choice at that point from a tax standpoint is to defer, postpone income to a later year, which actually means that you're postponing to a higher tax bracket. If you're going to have any amount of retirement income, you're actually going to be in a higher tax bracket than you are now because you're going to have absolutely no deductions when you retire. Most people have the house paid off. Most people, they, if you're lucky, your children have gone and you don't have them for dependents. And you're really left with just pure income. And retirement income, of course, is taxed. If it's through a 401k or an IRA, it's taxed at the highest possible rate. So it really is a challenge if you're an employee. So what it means is that um, uh, we like to say is that if you want to change your tax, you have to change your facts. Because tax is really based on your facts and circumstances. And the tax laws aren't the same for every, every fact and circumstance, as you know. You know, somebody who's an entrepreneur has a, a different tax set of tax rules than somebody who's an employee. And somebody who's a big business owner has a different set of tax rules than somebody who's a small business owner. Somebody who's a professional investor has a different set of tax rules than somebody who's a casual investor. So uh, the, the key is to find, okay, what, are you, what do you want to do from an investment standpoint at that point? What do you want to do from a business standpoint? Are you willing to be an entrepreneur? Are you willing to, for example, first thing, are you willing to shift from being an employee to being self-employed? That's the first step for a high-paid professional is if you can and are willing to do that, there are different tax opportunities for you than you would have as an employee. If you're willing to and interested in investing and particularly becoming more of a professional, you or your spouse becoming a professional investor, there are different opportunities to reduce your taxes. If you're going to stay as a high-paid employee, though you're pretty much just sunk <laughs> that's right exactly that's why i'm trying to get these people out there to 
to change their facts. Now, let me go and say this. I think a lot of people, when they hear you talk about maybe you should become a business owner or maybe become an entrepreneur, they might say, well, but, you know, Tom, I, I'd love to do that, but I'm pretty busy because, you know, I'm, I'm a physician. I make $250,000 per year. You know, how can I change my facts? And does it make sense for me to change my facts? Can you give us an example of, say, somebody in that sort of situation who might have just tweaked their situation a little bit and who actually benefited from some of the tax opportunities? Sure. That, that's actually an easy one, but thanks for the softball question. <laughs> um, so, you know, as a, as a physician, for example, you, you, most physicians have a choice. Uh, they may not realize they have a choice, but most do have a choice of being an employee or being self-employed. So you could have, for example, if you work for a hospital, you could have the hospital hire your company or they can hire you personally. If they hire your company, now you're self-employed. Now, you know, physicians go, yeah, but now I have a payroll and I have payroll taxes that I have to deal with, et cetera, et cetera. And my answer to that is, you're right, that your company does have those things, but that doesn't mean you have to do them. Uh, the, the challenge that I find with most physicians and lawyers and, and uh, accountants even is that they have this feeling that, you know, if you're going to get something done right, you have to do it yourself. And that's just baloney. The reality is, if you're going to do something right, you got to have the person who's most qualified do it, okay? And that's probably not you. Uh, my friend Robert Kiyosaki is is uh, fond of saying that investing is a team sport. Well, being in business is a, is even more of a team sport than investing, I would say. It really is a. I mean, you have to involve a team. That uh, you know, if it's 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 no different than if you're operating on somebody. And you've got a team around you. I mean, you're not going to be the one who does the anesthesiology. You're not going to be the one who probably does the, the, the radiology. You're probably not going to be the one who um, handles the, all of the equipment. You're probably not the one who schedules everything. If you do all of that yourself, you're pretty ineffective. Okay, but if you have a team around you, then you become very, very effective. Well, the same is true when you're in business. When you have a team around you, you go, yeah, but I have to pay those people. Oh, yeah, you do. Okay, but the reason you pay them is so that you're freed up to do other things. See, it's always, uh, to me, it's, I'm, a, I'm an accountant, so everything's bottom line, right? Everything's, what's the end result financially to that situ this situation. And if I can pay somebody else to do it, I would say pretty much, if I can pay somebody to do it, even 80% as well as I would do it, I'm going to pay somebody else to do it. Because there are certain things that only I can do, okay, that I'm going to do so much better than everybody else that it makes sense for me to do. But those are the only things that it makes sense for me to do. So let's, you know, let's bring that team together. And actually, frankly, um, um, Buck, your, your CPA is actually a key component of that because they're the ones who have the Rolodex, um, as we used to call a Rolodex. Uh, they're the ones who have all those people available. So, um, you know, they really should be able to help you, you know, put that together. But in the first place, they should probably be recommending this in the first place in order to reduce your taxes. I think, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to add to that is that, you know, they may sound theoretical to some of you out there, but I am actually a perfect example. I actually engaged uh, Tom's firm provision a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, and worked with uh, Rob Dinas over there uh, because I wanted to try to figure out how to reduce my own taxes. Now, my situation is different. I have, you know, several entities and I do a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm a business owner, real estate owner, et cetera, but I can personally credit provision for probably saving me, you know, seven figures plus uh, in the last three years in taxes. So if you'd like uh, that kind of benefit, it might be worthwhile to call provision or someone of that caliber. Now, let me let me go to the another point here, because, Tom, I think one of the things that, um, you know, I tell my audience is, again, you know, if I have, for example, my neighbor, one of my neighbors is a, a neurosurgeon who signed a pretty decent contract for, you know, it was like a $2 million plus uh, per year contract. You know, he's got no time. I mean, geez, he's never even home. Right. So for a guy like that, then, you know, it might not make as much sense to try to become self-employed. But there, if you look at Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, he's generating income as a W-2 wage earner. He's not self-employed. But if you 
go to the other side of the quadrant, you know, you don't have to be just a business owner. You could also be an investor who is sophisticated and can put your money to work that way as well. Isn't that right? For sure. I mean, the, the tax law, first thing for people to understand is the tax law, we think of it as a way to raise revenue for the government, and it is. But to give you a perspective, the tax law raises about $2 trillion a year in income tax, whereas the tax law actually provides $17.1 trillion of tax benefits. So the primary purpose of the tax law is not to raise revenue. The primary purpose of the tax law is to direct government policy. So uh, it's become that way over the last 40, 50 years. So the, the, the tax law fundamentally is just a series of incentives. Okay, that's what it is. It's a series of incentives. Now, those incentives fall heavily to the business owner and the professional investor. Now, somebody who doesn't have time to set themselves up as their own business probably doesn't have time to be a professional investor either. But still, there's opportunities because, first of all, if you're married and your spouse has time, because what what qualifies you for a professional investor would qualify your spouse as a professional investor and your spouse um, may have more time than you do in order to do that. So again, employee team members. I mean, you're right, uh, Buck, it does take some time up front. Okay. And you cannot, I, I don't, I think if you're going to be an investor, you'd better spend that time up front also, because otherwise you're going to lose a lot of money. There's no group of investors in the history of the world that have lost as much money as doctors. <laughs> I, I think that is an absolute fact. And I'm, I mean, doctors are just noted. I mean, geez, you got, you got too much money here. Give some to me, right? Because right. I'll, I'll take care of you. You know, I'll take care of it. You don't have to spend any time at it. Well, that's a sure way to just seriously, just pay your CPA more and they'll be happy. You'll, and you won't have your money, which apparently is what makes you happy. And you don't have to worry about whether you're going to get anything back because you're not, you know, just, just give it away. I mean, make a charitable contribution, do something with it because investing without education education, okay, is no different than giving your money away yep. because you're going to lose it. Yep. Okay. So, so you have to make, uh, I mean, here's the thing. You, you got a $2 million contract. So l- let's look at that $2 million contract. That person, that $2 million contract, unless they live in a non-tax state is going to pay 50% of that in taxes. So that's a million dollars. So you're really down to a million dollars now. You're only making a million dollars. Right. Because at that point, you're saying, look, I, I, work, I, I spend so much time working, I don't have time to even pay attention to my taxes. Great. Then you're going to pay a million dollars in taxes. And if you're okay with that, then live with that. You go, okay, I, I've got a million dollars. The average person, even who is living very well, is not going to spend more than six hundred and six hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. So now you got three hundred to three hundred fifty thousand dollars left over. What are you going to do with it? Well, if you're not going to get an education, you might as well just put it in an ETF or a mutual fund or something like that, and just take your chances, you know, or put it in gold and silver or something like that. Something that doesn't take any education to do, right? But if you actually want to set get money put aside and actually have an interest and have some control over it, you still are going to have to take some time with a professional, with investing professional, with getting educated. You know, you you didn't become a surgeon. You didn't become a doctor. You didn't do that without a serious investment in education. And why doctors think that, well, I needed to spend 10 years of education for my profession, but I don't need to spend any time for my investment education. I just think it's such a ridiculous mistake. And if you look at it that way, you know, and, and doctors go, well, duh. Yeah. Okay. And yet that's what doctors do. Well, yeah. And, and I'm, we've talked about it on this show before as well. And, and while I think doctors in general are typically a, sort of the prototypical example of this, you see this all across the board in terms of people who are highly educated. And, and you know, this is because, of course, we spend so much time. A lot of us, you know, with our heads down in our books, reading and learning and mastering a profession. And sometimes, you know, we don't even think about money, but we know that there's going to be money in the background. But we spend so much time of our lives trying to figure out how we're going to make a living, make money. But then we spend virtually no time figuring out how we're going to actually invest that money. And so that that's a lot about what this show is all about. And also, of course, a, a big um, something that we talk a lot about is exactly what you're saying, 
Tom, is that it is does take a team and it takes I, I like to think of it as a community of community of of advisors and friends and colleagues that you trust and you know word gets around. So getting involved and taking some time in your own investments is a good idea. The alternative to that is losing all your money and being another paid professional, a high paid professional who's going to die broke. Now, tell, let's talk a little bit, let's pivot a little bit to some specific things that I think are, are interesting because you mentioned that, you know, taxes a lot of times are, I think in your book, you said something to the effect that, uh, you know, it was like less than 5% of, or maybe it was even less than that of the tax code is actually about how to generate revenue. And the rest is, you know, how you can avoid taxes. And the government uses the tax code in part to get what it wants. For example, you know, we've got oil and gas and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how, of course, with the right advice and with the uh, right advisors, uh, those types of things might come into play? Again, thanks for the softball question. <laughs> um, appreciate that. Uh, no, well, never, I, I never, agree never, with no, you I on never, most never, things. <laughs> I never turn those down. I mean, that, that, it, it's awesome. The very first thing we have to do in any time we're getting educated is to find the context of what we're dealing with. So if you're a, a brain surgeon, that's a different context than a heart surgeon, frankly. I think that you have to look at the context. Most people look at the text, I go, oh, this is something that it's way too complicated. Einstein said it was the most difficult thing to, in the world to understand was the tax law. That's Albert Einstein, okay? Certainly the greatest genius of our time um, in the last hundred years. And yet the reality is it's very simple. There is actually less than 1% of the tax law. It's uh, about 30 pages of the tax law out of 6,000 raises revenue. The rest of it is a guide to how to reduce your taxes. Now, once you get that context shift, once you shift your mind from this is something to be afraid of to this is something to embrace, this is uh, the way the rich get richer. If you want to, you know, if you're making $2 million a year, you're rich, but you're not getting richer. Okay, mm -hmm. unless you are reducing your taxes and building wealth. The way the rich get richer is very simple. It's through debt and taxes. The rich use debt to get rich. They use other people's money and the rich use the tax law. The way the tax law is meant to be used, this is not a dodge. This is, I don't even think this is avoiding taxes. It's certainly not evading them, but it's, I don't even think it's avoiding them. You know, another context shift is get away from the idea of a loophole. A loophole is, um, Give you an example. So New York Times in the last little bit has talked a lot about Donald Trump and, and his tax benefits. And most of his tax benefits are not loopholes, okay? Most of them come from being a real estate investor. Most of them come from being a business owner, okay? I did read one thing that he did to make sure he got his losses that uh, were attributable to him, and, and that was a loophole. And it actually was subsequently closed about 10 years after he used it. It was closed, a loophole. But don't, don't focus on loopholes. The, the, most of what we're talking about here are intentional tax benefits, intentional tax benefits to drive tax policy. In, in, in every country is this way. I just got back from Kazakhstan, and I was in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. I was in Finland. I was in Estonia. I was in Russia. I was in Ukraine. And that was just a few weeks ago. Every country is the same. Every country uses the tax law to promote its policies. So like you said, you know, the, the U.S. has long held a policy of energy independence, and so it gives a huge tax break. And this is one the doctors, this is the one tax break that is easiest for the doctors to take advantage of because it's the one that applies to passive investors. It's, it's really the only um, investment tax break that truly applies to passive investors, and that's the oil and gas deduction for drilling new oil wells. And... The challenge with the oil business is it's full of crooks. It really is. And a lot of uh, so-called drillers out there, they're just preying on doctors, primarily doctors and other high paid professionals. And they say, give me your money. You get a tax break from this. And so don't worry about it. And then they just steal their money. Right. And that happens actually a lot more than you may think. Um, it, it's, I would say about 50% of the oil and gas, so-called oil and gas developers out there are just thieves. Okay, so, so you do have to find an oil and gas driller that actually is not a thief, and then you have to find one that knows what they're doing, which is an even smaller pool. 
but that is a tax benefit, okay? That it's a, it's a legitimate tax benefit. The government wants you to invest in oil. They would like us to have more. That's for a long time been government policy. Our uh, current President Obama has fought that policy for years, but unsuccessfully. So it's still the policy of the U.S. government. Another one is real estate. I mean, real estate has long been, really since Ronald Reagan, there's been a policy that favors real estate investing. In other words, the, the more real estate you buy, the less tax you pay. Actually, the more money you make in real estate, the less tax you will pay. That is pretty much the rule in real estate. So that's another another tax benefit. But I'll give you some others, I mean, that, that you may be taking advantage of. You send your child to college, you get a tax credit. You buy a house, you get a mortgage deduction, you give money to charity, you get a, a charitable deduction. You, you know, these are all incentives. The, nobody would call the mortgage interest deduction a loophole, okay? Nobody would argue that we shouldn't be getting that tax deduction, and yet at the same time we argue that Donald Trump should not be getting his real estate tax benefits. That makes no sense. Just because somebody doesn't pay tax doesn't necessarily mean they're a crook doesn't mean they're not a crook but it doesn't mean they are a crook what it means is is that uh, are they smart you know i mean trump his famous debate quote that you know i, I don't pay taxes because kind of smart i would say he doesn't pay tax because he has smart advisors I, I think he's smart to have a good team around him you know looking how he's uh, avoided taxes i'm going that's pretty smart. I mean, it was all with everything I could see was well within the law. So it, it is a series of tax incentives. It's a series of incentives. So you, you want to take advantage of them, take advantage of them. If you're paying high taxes, you are not doing what the government wants you to do. It's that simple. Yeah. And actually, it's funny. I, I remember you saying uh, in your book that you actually consider it to be patriotic because you're doing what the government is, you know, what of they're course. asking you to do. So I, I love that because I think one of the big problems that I have when I talk to, you know, some of my colleagues who are, are curious about the types of things that I'm doing. And when I tell them that, you know, a big part of what I try to do is in, invest in things and tailor my businesses around reducing taxes, you know, I always so I always get somebody raising their eyebrow at me as if I'm doing something wrong because everybody's sort of terrified by this idea of loopholes when they're actually tax benefits that are encouraged. And they are terrified of the A word. They're terrified of the audit. What do you say to people uh, like that? Oh, actually, I, I give everybody a, a way to never be afraid of an audit. And you just have to write this down. All you have to write down is, I will never speak to the IRS. You write that down. You repeat that over and over again. Don't ever, as a taxpayer, speak to the IRS. That is not what you should be doing. That is the job of a professional, okay? And, you know, one of the challenges, uh, again, that we have with, with doctors, frankly, is that they think, well, you know, I'm, I'm smarter than the IRS. Well, okay, but chances are you're going to screw it up, okay? I mean, it's just the way it is. So don't talk to them. And then you don't have to worry about it. You know, hire a professional to prepare the tax return, hire, hire a professional to uh, help you with your planning, and hire a professional to handle the audit. Uh, I'll give you an example. You can call the IRS all you want. You'll be on hold. Um, if you're lucky, you'll only be on hold for five or six hours and they'll actually answer, but they answer less than 50% of the calls that come in. That's the response rate. Okay. On the other hand, tax professional has a magic IRS number. We only have to be on hold for an hour. <laughs> we used to actually not have to be on hold for more than five minutes, but now it's about an hour to an hour and a half. We have to get on hold, but we're talking to a true tax professional. They won't talk to a, a taxpayer. They will only talk to a, a professional, a tax professional, um, like a CPA or a lawyer. And we can resolve the issue because we know how to deal with the IRS. It's, it's what we do for a living. Uh, I, IRS audits never scare me because I, I happen to know where those people went to school. And it was not the University of Texas. It was University of Podunk someplace else, right? Uh, think about this. If, if you're going go to go to accounting school and you go, okay, what would I like to do for a living? I could go out and help entrepreneurs. I could be a, a, a tax expert helping entrepreneurs. I could help businesses. I could help. I, I could even do financial statements. I could help them with their finances, et cetera. Or, or I could go work with, for the IRS where my customer hates me, absolutely detests the fact that I exist. Right. You don't get the best and the brightest in the IRS, okay? But don't believe that because you get don't get the best and the brightest that that means it's okay for you to go up against them because you're they still know more than you do and they have power, 
Okay, so that's why I always say just don't ever talk to the IRS, and then you don't have to worry about it. Have a good professional team on your side and let them worry about it. The other thing I I tell people is that with regard to taxes, it's don't break the law. You know, I mean, if if you've got Mm -hmm. a great tax advisor who's giving you good advice, so what if you get audited? You know, if you're doing what you know, the government says you can do and you've got a good tax professional and, you know, great CPA and attorney. We really have nothing to fear. It's if, if you're actually being patriotic by doing what the government is asking you to do, then even if you get audited, so what? The reality is that a lot of people who start making a lot of money get audited. So it's not the end of the world, is it? Well, no, I, I agree with you on that, Buck. Um, I appreciate you saying that. Please don't cheat. I, mean, I would say this to everybody. Don't cheat. You don't have to. If, if you have a good tax advisor and you do a little bit of your own homework, okay, that's why I wrote the book Tax Free Wealth. When I wrote it, actually, um, I asked Rob, my partner, he uh, at the time was our managing partner, and I said, uh, so Rob, what should we leave out of the book? And he said, put it all in. Because we need to get this message out. Do your homework, okay? Do a little homework. Get a good tax advisor. There's a chapter 23 of Tax Free Wealth that tells you how to find a good tax advisor, okay? And don't cheat. Because you, if you cheat, you have to be right 100% of the time. That's the problem. You have to win 100% of the time if you cheat. If you cheat, frankly, I think you should go to jail. I'm going to be the first one saying you should go to jail if you cheat. I will not take you as a client. I will not work with you. I have no interest in people who cheat, whether they cheat on their wives or cheat on their taxes. To me, it's all the same. It's still cheating. You don't have to. The tax law is 99.9% of the tax law is uh, tax incentives. It's, it's ways to reduce your taxes legitimately. I don't even think most of it is a gray area. I think most of it's black and white, and, and, and you just have to understand the law. And, and the key is to have, it's just like you wouldn't go to a doctor that didn't understand what they were doing. I mean, you know, the better the doctor, typically the more expensive they are, but you would always want the best doctor. Well, the same should be true with your financial professionals. I mean, you always want the best financial professional because they don't have to cheat. Go back to Donald Trump. His tax advisors don't have to cheat, okay, because they've got lots to work with. I mean, business owner and real estate investor, are you kidding me? They, they have the entire tax law to work with. Um, if you go to a highly paid professional who's an employee, boy, they're, they're stuck. And so there's a tendency to want to cheat. I find more people as uh, employees and self-employed, I find more cheating there than I do on the business owner investor uh, side of things. And I think it's because they just feel like, wow, I don't have many opportunities here. I'm going to cheat. One of the interesting things that I think that I noticed when I was first out of training uh, and started making some money and uh, was looking for some help. And I wanted somebody who knew the tax law and who wasn't just going to, you know, sign a signature and, and tell me to pay my money. And that was it. I wanted a, I wanted a little bit of a, a discussion and an understanding of the law and so on and so forth. And so I got referred to people who were dealing with a lot of high net worth people or people who are making a lot of money. But what is shocking to me in retrospect is how they were so conservative and they were unwilling to look at some of these things that uh, that I know through working with provision, et cetera, that there really is, uh, as you said, they're not gray areas, they're black and white, that you actually can do these things, that you can. And and so so why do you think that is? I mean, because the, there's these CPAs other that, that just, you know, they, they're they supposed to know the same thing you do, but obviously they don't. And they're actually in positions where they're managing a lot of high paid professionals money. Well, think of it this way. What, what makes something conservative or aggressive is a function of your education and training, right? Mm-hmm. So let's say you have a, somebody who, whose primary function is internal medicine, okay? Mm-hmm. Somebody goes to med school, goes to internal medicine, and then they're asked to perform a highly complicated brain surgery. Probably not a good idea. That would be aggressive for them to perform that surgery, and it would be stupid, It'd be stupid for the person who hired them to perform that surgery. On the other hand, you hire a highly trained brain surgeon to do it, and they're going, oh, yeah, that's a piece of cake. That's a conservative procedure, okay, because they know what they're doing. The, the, the same is true in, in my profession. I mean, whether something is conservative or aggressive is a function of your training 
and education. So for me, for example, to do a sophisticated real estate structuring where I'm able to get the, the, the best tax benefits for somebody, it's all going to be very conservative to me because I've done it a hundred times. Okay. Whereas you take somebody who's never done that before. Wow. That's aggressive. I, I, uh, I actually was teaching a class not too long ago and one of the attendees had their CPA with them. And one of my uh, buddies overheard the CPA turn to his client and say, wow, this guy's really aggressive. Or you can't do said, that. <laughs> and, and, oh, oh, okay. So don't get me started, Buck. So every place we go, Robert and I, you know, actually literally been on six continents this year uh -huh. um, together. And every place we go, I get somebody who says, you can't do that here. <laughs> every single place. It doesn't matter if it's Phoenix, Arizona, or Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. So we are in Bishkek um, not too long ago. And I... Uh, we even talk about it on stage now about the, I can't do that here. And yet still, by the end of the night, I had somebody come up to me and say, well, you can't do that here. And I'm going, well, you can't do that here. I get it. Yeah. You can't. Right. Okay. I can, but you can't. We had a very well-respected attorney come up to us in Santiago, Chile, and, and told me flat out, you can't deduct cars here because they're considered a luxury. I said, so I told, I actually told Robert about the conversation. He says, okay, so tomorrow morning I want you to get up and tell him how to deduct a car. Well, we came at it from a very different approach. Right. Okay. And uh, he was right that the law says you can't deduct a car, but that doesn't mean there isn't a way to deduct a car. It just means that if you're just looking at, at the law as a linear progression, then you're right. You can't. Okay, but if you look at the con, if you shift your context and look at a bigger picture, we actually showed him how not only could he deduct the car, but he could actually make money from buying the car. Wow, can you do okay? that here? Absolutely. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yes, but we can do that here. Okay, um, actually, I'm, I'm writing a book now, uh, Seven Investments That the Government Will Pay You to Make. Oh, that's awesome. When is that coming out? Uh, that will sh should be out next spring. So I'm, I'm very excited about that book. Wow. Uh, it's actually called Why the Government Wants You to Be Rich, um, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And uh, the reality is, it's, it's again, it's education, it's context. You're either conservative or aggressive based on how sophisticated your education is and your experience. So I can't blame them for that. They should not be going outside their comfort zone. They really shouldn't. Okay. I just think the people, I, you know, my goal with professionals is to get them to have a bigger comfort zone. That's yeah, all. Yeah. So. Uh, we are recording uh, this today, the day before the presidential election between Hillary and uh, Trump. And, you know, I have a bunch of entrepreneurs, real estate investors and sponsors, in addition to high paid uh, professionals listening to this. Now, Trump has talked about, you know, a lot of the tax advantages for syndicators and fund managers that he's taken. And he actually in one debate reminded Hillary that, you know, she could have helped repeal some of those over the past 30 years, hinting that, you know, he, he might do that even if he were elected. Um, who knows if he would or not. But regardless of who gets elected, Tom, what are some of the major changes that we might see in the tax law over the next few years that we should pay attention to as, you know, as business owners and real estate investors? Well, you know, there's actually a list of about of 100 revenue raisers that the IRS maintains and Treasury maintains, and and this actually the staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation, they they have this list, and they're looking at. So so what you do is you look at what are both candidates saying should change, and one of them is the carried interest rule. So the carried interest rule, for those who don't understand what that means, is that when you're a real estate developer, and you say, look, all of the regular income is going to go to the investors. I'm not going to take anything until this puppy sells. When it sells, I'm going to take some of the gain on the sale. Well, that's capital gain. That's a carried interest. What Wall Street has done is they've created a loophole out of that. That was intended for real estate developers, um, but they figured out that they can do the same thing when they go in and do an acquisition of a company. Okay, so they do the same thing. You know, the, the venture capitalists will do it. And so what they're saying is, is look, if you have this potential capital gain. You're, in other words, you're not getting paid a fee. Instead, you're going to get a capital gain on a success fee. Once it sells, you get a percentage. 
that's one that actually both candidates have said they're going to eliminate. So I, I think that's in serious trouble. I, I think that's one that, unfortunately, I think that it's Wall Street that's really kind of bastardized that. And, you, you know, that's what happens. And now is, so, Tom, is that just for developers or is that also for syndicators who are, say, putting together a deal and buying things and they're taking, you know, they're taking well, yeah, 10, same, 20%. Same, same difference. Right, yeah. right, right, right. So syndicator, I mean, I look at a syndicator as a developer from my standpoint when I put that in. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, it's it's going to affect the syndicators. Um, and and I, I don't know that there's a way to stop it. Now, the only thing that might stop it actually is Trump. If he were to get massive tax reform, and his tax plan actually is, if you look at it, it's actually very, very similar to Ronald Reagan's. So in that regard, probably the only place where you can say those two are similar, <laughs> but they are similar yeah. in what they want to do from a tax right, standpoint. Right. If you bring the tax rate down for business owners down to uh, 15% or even 25%, what you do is you take the incentive to go do things for tax purposes. You take it right out of the law. Because if you're paying 25% or less in taxes, you're really not going to pay a lot of attention to tax when you make an investment or when you make a business decision. Um, you're going to make it more for financial purposes. And that's really what Reagan did. Remember, he went down to two tax rates. And when he did that, uh, of course, you know, they crept back up pretty quickly. But when he did that, people stopped paying attention to the, the tax benefits. So that's something that could easily happen. Now, if, if that's the case, then you might still have the carried interest rule, but it would have no impact. Okay, because if, if you're down at a 15 to 25 percent rate and your carried interest rule gets you to a 20 to 23 percent rate, it's it's a difference without any real significance. So that's one. I, I, I think that uh, certainly you'd have more changes if Trump wins than if Hillary wins. Uh, Hillary actually doesn't uh, have many proposals out there. She wants to reduce the estate tax exemption, which I think is unlikely because I think you're going to have a Republican Congress. So I think it's going to be, be tough for her to get that done. But that's a significant one. She also wants to, of course, punish businesses for uh, having headquarters in the U.S., just like Obama has wanted to punish people for having headquarters in the U.S. Don't ask me to explain that policy position. I can't. Um, I think it's ridiculous. Mm. But that has been the position of Obama. That is Hillary's position. That was certainly Bernie Sanders' position. The Democrats definitely do want to punish people for having headquarters in the U.S. And so if uh, she's president, then you will see a push in regulations, not in law, because it'll never get passed in law, but through regulations, which she has control over, because that's the administrative branch of the government. And that's what that's what Obama's done, is he's actually restricted what U.S. companies can do overseas. Um, he's done that through regulation. And I think you'll see a continuation of that. Trump, of course, has the opposite approach. He says we ought to encourage people to be um, have headquarters in the U.S. And a 15 percent tax rate would actually make us a tax haven. Yeah. OK, which means you would actually have people you'd have companies from Asia and Australia and Europe that would, I think, flock to the U.S., um, because the U.S. would be a tax haven, right. okay? And so um, that would be a, a, a very different situation. It'll be interesting to watch, though. I, I think the most important thing is have a tax, make sure your tax advisor gives you regular updates. Yeah. Um, we do actually have a free newsletter. It goes out every week. You're probably a subscriber. And if you're interested, just go to taxfreewealthadvisor.com and taxrealthadvisor.com and, and you can you know get onto our, our mailing list and we're just happy to get information out every week. One more quick question along that line. Do you think the 1031 exchange laws are going to change? I don't. I don't see it changing. Uh, nobody's proposed that it changes. Hillary could because you know her, her first proposal was to extend the capital gains holding period to six years. And, and of course you can deal with that through 1031 exchanges because you've got a tacked on holding period. So you would get through your six years just by exchanging and exchanging and exchanging, and you'd still have your six year, you'd be able to get to your six year period pretty, pretty easily under Hillary's um, proposal. So it'll be interesting to see if, if she proposes a change to that. I don't see it happening. I hope the real estate lobby is doesn't fall asleep like it did in 1986 with the passive loss rules. Um, it completely was caught off guard and completely fell asleep at the wheel. 
And uh, let, let, let's hope it doesn't. I mean, it took them seven years to get the real estate professional rule in there. Did, and, I, you know, I actually learned that Donald Trump uh, was uh, a key lobbyist, uh, right? part of the lobbying for the uh, real estate professional rule. Right. So I, I found that to be pretty interesting. Makes sense. I mean, yeah. it would be a big deal for him. Well, listen, uh, Tom, you know, if I, I have had, as I said, a great pleasure working with uh, Rob Dinas over at uh, Provision, which is your firm. And I can honestly say that his uh, grand plan that he set up for me has saved me a lot of money over the last few years. So I certainly want to I'd, I'd like to plug that personally. And that's uh, you can you can find provision at provision dot com. Is that right? Pro, provision wealth dot com. Pro, provision pro, wealth dot com. Provision wealth dot com. And you can call us at eight six six four six seven five eight zero nine eight six six four six seven five eight zero nine. Can you just. You know, because this is not a provision's not just a tax firm. And in fact, what I used uh, provision for was was one of your strategy programs. Can you just briefly tell us a little bit about those programs? Well, yeah, we, we actually what we found was years ago, we we started doing tax strategies. And first question we have to ask is, so what's your investment strategy? And the answer is, well, I don't have an investment strategy. I'm going, well, then I can't help you. Right. Right, because you have to be an investor. Yeah, I, I need your. I need to know what your investment strategy is to know how to help you from a tax standpoint. So what we did was we designed. This is many many years ago, 15 years ago. We designed a system to help people determine what their investment strategy should be. We call it a wealth strategy, and it's really just a narrowing of your focus. When you when you look at a good investor or an average investor versus a great investor, the the difference is is the average investor. They look at every single deal as a new deal. That's what they do, and as, as a new opportunity. That's, that, that's the amateur investor. The professional investor makes a decision once and applies that decision over and over again. So, you know, you look at a Donald Trump, you see that he's doing the same thing over and over again. You look at the real estate guys, they do the same thing over and over again. You look at my friend Ken McElroy, I can tell you precisely what his investment strategy is. And I'm not a CPA, I just know his investment strategy right. because he's very, very specific that he only invests in class B properties in tier two cities. And, you know, he, he, he wants a certain amount of vacancy, uh, uh, actually more, the, the more, the better. And, and so, you know, he's looking at very specific things. A professional investor will get very, very narrow in their focus. Um, if you look at people who made lots of money, whether it's Branson or Bill Gates or uh, Donald Trump or anybody who's made a lot of money, they've done it doing one thing and one thing really, really well. Okay, so I would suggest whether you're a, a high paid professional, whether you're an entrepreneur or whatever, when it comes to investing, what you want to do is you want to get really clear on what, what that one thing is. And of course, we'll only spend time at something that we enjoy. Right. So one of the things we do, as you know, is uh, we use the Colby A index, which helps us actually uh, assist the investor in determining what they'll actually enjoy doing. Okay, right. so, you know, you can make money in anything. You can make money in real estate, you make money in business, you make money on gas, you, and you can lose money in anything, right? You make money in the stock market, you can lose money in the stock market. It's, it's a matter, it's, it's not a function of the investment as so much as it's a function of the investor. And so what we're doing there is we're actually helping people become a better investor. And we, we don't give investment advice. We don't tell you, you know, you should put your money here, you should put your money there. We don't handle people's money for them at all. Um, what we do is we're strategists. That's what we are. We're, we look at the future. We look at, you know, you. We look at how, how to marry what, you know, your natural instincts, what you like to do, and come up with an investment or a wealth strategy as well as a tax strategy that you'll be really comfortable with, that, that makes sense to you, that takes as much time as you want to take with it, as little time as you want to take with it, and uh, something where you can just, you know, you can have less risk and higher returns. Well, there you have it. Rich Dad Advisor Tom Wheelwright. Tom, thanks for being with us today and, and sharing all of this really, really priceless knowledge. Hey, thank you, Buck. It's been fun. And thanks for all the great softball questions. Really appreciate that. Good job. And thank you especially for doing this because uh, this podcast is important. What I notice around the world is that, and it's, it's true in the U.S., it's true everywhere I go, people do not have this information. And so the more people that are out there 
providing this information, the better off the world will be because when people are successful in investing and successful in uh, following the tax law uh, to reduce their taxes, then everybody is better off. So thank you so much for doing it. Coming from you, that's a big compliment, Tom. So once again, everybody, wealthformula.com. We will see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.